crewmates are next in line to launch to the International Space Station. Chris, in a nutshell, tell me, what are the goals of your mission and what is your role on this crew? That's a great question. The, uh, the goals of our mission are similar to all the subsequent space station missions that are happening now, and that is, since we're completed with the assembly portion of the space station, now it's time to utilize all this fantastic facility and national laboratory that it is. So we're, we're tasked with uh, carrying out some of the science experiments and the research that uh, is ongoing on the space station, as well as to do some um, maintenance and upkeep with various activities, some Russian EVA spacewalks that will be happening, and there might be some spacewalks on the U.S. side as well, and plenty of visiting vehicles. Our timeline is chock full of, uh, of visiting vehicles coming with cargo and going with, with uh, disposable cargo. So will be completely full with uh, visiting vehicles, maintenance, and carrying out the science experiments. Of course, you've been to this space station once before. Uh, this time it's going to be for a much longer stay, and the station has changed. W what are you most looking forward to about to seeing there this time? You know, I'm really, really excited about going there and staying for a while and really settling in and, and having my little nook and corner w with my things and just having it be a home. When you're there on a shuttle mission, um, it's a very busy timeline, and, and uh, you're always thinking, okay, what do I got to do next? What do I got to do next? And it's hard to take the second, take, take a step back and enjoy the facility um, that it is. So I'm just really looking forward to settling in and, uh, and getting sort of a, a work pace and living there um, for the full six months. Now, I, you asked what the... Um, the, the station the, itself is different than, yeah, than what you saw. Right, exactly. So... There's more modules. I wasn't there. Wh I was there prior to Node 3 arriving, and the, per and the PMM uh, right there, both off of Node 1. Node 1 was a much smaller environment when I was there. It was just the airlock in Node 1. And so that whole area has drastically changed with the additional facilities that Node 3 brings with it, the hygiene compartment and the exercise and the cupola with the fantastic views. So I'm really looking forward to getting up there and seeing what the, what the uh, cupola brings to the space station. Now, I was involved with that, adding some, adding the um, exposed facility to the Japanese portion of the space station. And that was a great opportunity, too. So I'm um, looking forward to just getting back up there. There's a possibility your mission could start with something new to the program. They're discussing having your Soyuz docked to the station the same day as you launch. A couple of questions that brings to mind. The first is, what is the advantage of launching and docking to the space station on the same day? So it's a really exciting and interesting concept to do. Now, typically, for, for folks that are watching that are not familiar with the, the rendezvous process, we'll launch on one day, go to bed, be up that whole second day, really, um, with a few tasks and activities, but not much uh, significant activity on that second day, and then go to sleep again and wake up and rendezvous on that third day, middle of the day kind of type of thing. So we'll scrunch that whole timeline down into about a six hour period. Um, the interesting thing from a human point of view is we, ne we don't have the t time to take off our spacesuits. So we'll be strapped in in our seats, uh, in our spacesuits for the whole duration of that six hour period plus the pre-launch activity. So it'll be a long day and a lot of time in the suits. Now you ask what's the benefit to that. I'm assuming there must be one. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're, the benefit to us from a crew point of view is we get to the space station faster. You know, there's when you're in the Soyuz, the Soyuz is a very small vehicle. It's designed with a specific purpose and that's to get crews up and down home uh, safely into the space station or to space safely. And it does that in a fantastic job. But it's not the most comfortable vehicle to be in for an extended period of time. The toilet is right next to where you sleep, which is right next to your buddy. and eating and it's all it's like living for a day in a in a, a smart car or a Volkswagen Beetle it's very scrunched so the benefit to us is we get to the space station faster with the facilities that it offers much more comfortable type of environment to be in um, and it also demonstrates some technology that's useful in visiting vehicles and other other uh, space vehicles to to get to the space station on that same day is it a difficult technical thing to launch and get there in just a few orbits instead of two and a half days? Well, from a crew point of view, it's really not that much different. The, the tasks that we do are all the same tasks that we would have done in that three-day period. 
However, they just, the timeline is smaller. So there's shorter gaps in between the discrete activities that we have to take care of to, to stay on the correct orbital flight path to make it to the space station correctly. So really, um, our tasks are the same. They're just s closer together. I've understood that one of the reasons for making it a two-day or three-day flight was to allow the crew members time to get acclimated to being in a weightless environment. This you'd do without that, or at least you, you would have to do it after you arrived at the station. Yeah. You know, I thought a lot about that, and I think that the having never ridden in a Soyuz, but I, I have my shuttle experience and going to the space station, I remember from the shuttle opening that hatch and floating into the space station and feeling that it was so gigantic and the volume uh, for, into which you we floated with there you could be in the middle and not have a hand or a foot on some piece of side uh, some piece of structure which is not the case in the shuttle you're always close enough to grab something even more so the case on a Soyuz I mean you're, it's very very small as I just described so so the adaptation piece of that I think is a little bit different you know you're really not truly adapting in the day, day and a half, two days on the Soyuz, that you, the same adaptation that you'll have once you get to the space station, just because it's a different perspective for your brain to get its arm around. The plan, I assume then, would be for all future Soyuzes to dock on launch day? I'm not sure about that. That's a decision that'll probably be made uh, on the, on, in, by Roscosmos or the, the Russian side of the house, but uh, uh, certainly we're, um, what we learn will be passed on to the other crews and we'll see how it works out from there. We've made reference a few times to uh, different portions of the space station. Help us understand the place that you're going. Describe the International Space Station as it exists today, the, the different modules and, and systems that are there uh, to support you and your work. Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. It's a, in my basic brain, I think it's a phenomenal feat that it's built. If I in my neighborhood, if I tried to build a mobile hot dog stand and I said, okay, in my garage I'm going to build the chassis and the wheels and my neighbor's going to build the kitchen part and somebody else is going to build the navigation, I guarantee we'd have to go to Home Depot on the Saturday <laughs> when we actually put it together. And you can't go to Home Depot and put it together up in space. So it, just the fact that it exists and it's working so well is phenomenal. And so what are all those parts and pieces? The core U.S. structure with the lab and the nodes we, we have that are, allow us to expand and grow the space station. And off of those nodes are where the U.S., the international partner elements, the Japanese, off on the port side and, and the European module off on, on the starboard side of, of the vehicle. And further aft with the whole, the Russian segment of the space station. So it's a really expansive vehicle. And people always ask me, or is it going to be hard to, to be cramped up in a small tube? And that really doesn't describe it very well. It's, it's a series of rooms and turns and nooks and crannies, and uh, it can, you can really get away from people. You can uh, explore places that you haven't been before. I'm, I know that there are places that I wasn't there when I was on the shuttle time frame. I really didn't get around much on the, in the Russian side, so I'm excited to really understand and explore. Now that I know from all my training in Russia, I'm very familiar with the systems and the, and the, the Russian part of the vehicle, which was not the case when I was a shuttle guy. So um, it's, it's, it's really a large facility, and to me it didn't seem small when I was there on, on STS-127. It's even larger now, so uh, it's an interesting place to live. Since assembly of the station is essentially complete right now, the emphasis is on maintenance of the station in order to do the science mission. Can you explain what the potential is for what we can learn doing science on board the station? So there's really uh, that, that kind of branches off into several aspects. One, how can we improve technologies that help us here on Earth? And um, the most exciting part uh, from my perspective is long-term bone health for people as we age and um, we all have grandparents or parents that are aging or ourselves also and how do we stay healthy all through life and the key aspect of that and I'm not a medical doctor but what I've learned from being here and learning a little bit about the experiments that we'll be doing 
is bone health is a key part, a fundamental part to staying healthy as a human later in life. And how can we improve that bone health? And that's one of the main emphasis of the, some of the experiences, experiments that we'll be conducting is how to keep your bones healthy in zero G, which translates directly to, to on Earth. The other aspect of what, we're, what we can be learning while we're up there is how do we um, improve life for the astronauts and folks that will live long term in space for exploration, for long term living on a, the moon, Mars, or other planet, or what, what, whatever the case may be in the future. And, uh, and it's those, the same uh, experiments will help us with that as well. And finally, technology developments, you know, for the same exploration type of environments, we have a test bed, if you will, on the space station to really fine tune some of this te hard technical problems, engineering uh, problems, to make them reliable, robust systems that we can go explore other planets and uh, parts of the universe with. Let me get you to talk a little bit about some of those different sections. The, the biggest area of the research, as you say, is, is using you as a, as a test subject, you and all of your crewmates, uh, to find out how living in a weightless environment affects the human body and, and of course how to, to find ways to counteract that so that you can you can do work. Mm -hmm. um, and station partners in fact have recently agreed to, to send two crew members to space for a full year yeah. uh, in 2015 in order to advance that kind of research. What are your thoughts about that year-long mission? Well that's a, that's a long time and um, I come from a military background so I have a, quite a few friends that have spent close to that time or longer overseas, not in zero gravity, but away from their families and the separation um, from their loved ones. Similar type, it's kind of analogous to the year that, that Scott Kelly will be doing in space. And um, my perspective is how do you keep your mental focus and mental edge? I've had a few, four uh, long deployments myself um, in my military life and as a leader, I noticed that it was around, you know, different people that varied, but there was some point in a long deployment that people's mental edge started to fall, and, and you really had to keep a lookout for each other for the differences and, and, and to really know, okay, it's time for me to pick up the slack because my buddy is, uh, needs, needs a break today. And that's fine because tomorrow it's going to be the other way around. And so, so I think that's an interesting thing is how do you stay mentally sharp for that long when every day you have to perform? Every day you're conducting experiments. Every day you're doing something that could be harmful to the space station or yourself. So that's a, a lot to bear for one year. And it's, uh, it'll be hard. And, and uh, I think it's, we'll learn a lot on how because it's a long mission to go to Mars, for example. And so I think this will be great information, both physically, the physical person, as well as mentally, uh, staying sharp for the whole mission. Would you like to go to the station for a year? You know, it's a good question. I, uh, at a personal level, I wouldn't mind it. I, I would certainly miss my family, um, and it's a long time. But like I said, I have had plenty of friends and good families that have survived year-long deployments, so, so I know it's, it's, it's totally a doable thing, it's a, but it's a mental hurdle to get over. If uh, NASA asked me to go, I would probably say yes, but it would certainly be with a lot of discussion um, inside my house. <laughs> <laughs> and after you had the perspective of six months uh, in that environment, to have some idea of what you'd expect. Right, mm -hmm. right. From the perspective of someone who has spent some time uh, off of this planet, and you've experienced the effects of exposure to microgravity. What do you think we should be working on in order to maximize the chances of the successful human exploration of space out beyond Earth? Hmm. That's a great question. I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, it, we don't have to make it the most comfortable living facility. That We just need reliable systems. And I think if... Um, a crew is going to strap themselves onto a rocket and know that they're going off to really explore. It's the most important thing is to know that 
the system I'm writing is re reliable and I can count on it and that there's a team of experts behind us supporting all that, which is a 